Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to rotate this. Look at this. It's like a, what it was a Saturday Night Live skit. I'm just moving the podium here. Hold on. We just got to get in the camera shot. Make sure that uh, our guest microphone is on. There it is. Uh, thank you. And so, yeah, it's interesting when we, we decided to do this, because uh, we haven't really done something like this in a long time. We used to have an eggs and issues breakfast going back years that we used to talk to more of our uh, local elected officials, our county, our city, our school board. Um, but, you know, we had a very profound legislative session last year that raised a lot of phone calls, a lot of, call, a lot of comments, a lot of questions about, boy, what, what, what the heck happened? Uh, uh, whether, no matter where you fell on that spectrum. So that's why we're here today. A couple things before I get going I want to remind everybody of is the guests that I'll soon introduce are not elected officials. They are where their jobs are to be in this sphere. They detract politics really closely. They're both government relations employed professionals. So their job is just like ours uh, to make sure that legislation is good and strong as it can be and it represents their constituents. So just having said that, so when you start fielding questions, remember they didn't vote for these bills. They're just here to represent and tell us a little bit about them. And then we're also going to talk a little bit, a little, have a little dialogue at the end about, you know, what, what's next? What can we do? What can everybody do to, uh, you know, not to change necessarily what just happened, but how do you get involved and get engaged in the future? Uh, but before, so before I start, I'd be remiss not to acknowledge dignitaries in the audience. And I really appreciate our governor, Tim Walls, who came today. <laughs> governor, do you want to stand up? They're just new glasses. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyhow. I had I had, couldn't help that. That is a, you, he's a dead look-alike for our governor. Yeah. Uh, that's Eric Morley with Big Frog. So Big Frog and Woodbury support Big Frog. Um, if, I, if I make fun of him, I got to give him a plug. Uh, first up. Um, so uh, without said, I thought what we would start with before I get to the introductions, and I'm going to do that momentarily, because uh, not everybody's in the same level of engagement in politics. And just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been in banking for 35 years, and I'd say 30 of those 35 I've been engaged in how does the industry get better and how do we make sure that laws and, and rules and regulations uh, best serve the business community and ourselves. So for years I, I go to DC twice a year uh, to help lobby on behalf of the banking industry. I've been part of a government relations council for the Minnesota Bankers Association for 25. I think that's what they're recognizing in this year actually. Uh, and then I've been a part of our government relations team going back since time and right now also I currently chair the St. Paul Area Chamber PAC board, which is the Political Action Committee, and I'll talk about that too, because we have some openings on the board and love to see uh, some more faces here from Oakdale be a part of that. So, uh, yeah, I want to just talk a couple what I call fun facts or fast facts uh, about government. Uh, and this is, I don't want to say it's government for a fifth grader, but there are some things that I think are work. Uh, like first off, uh, a legislative session this last year started on January 3rd, 2023 and ended on May 22nd. So it's a very short-lived period of time that our legislators get together. Uh, to, to make policy and make rule. Uh, the legislators allotted, I don't know if people know this, 120 days per biennium. So biennium is a, only a political term about every two years. So every two years the biennium resets and so they have 120 days they can be in session. So this year they used 77 of those days. So if you subtract 77 from 120, that means next year's session, the most it can be is 43 days long. So I don't know if people, that's a fact that most people don't know, that if they really extend one year or one session, it could really be a detriment on the following year, which is going to be interesting to get their work done in 43 days next year. So another fact, after redistricting and the 2022 election, the Minnesota legislature had 71 new elected officials, 24 of those were senators, and 47 of them were House of Representatives. The 2023 legislative session was the first time one political party has held complete control in a decade. Uh, you know, we've, we've been blessed in Minnesota, and I'll say this, no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, most people tell you it's always good to have a little bit of check and balance. It's always good to have at least one sliver of the, the opposing party in one of the seats. And this year, first time in a decade, it's all controlled by one party. Uh, the DFL currently had a 70-64 majority in the House and a very slim 34-33 majority in the State Senate. So it was only a one vote difference in the State Senate. Uh, since the 2022 election, 35% of the Minnesota legis legislators made up of new legislators serving less than six months in their current body, which means they weren't that experienced. It means one third of our legislature basically didn't have experience. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that could be conceived as a, as a bad thing. Uh, let's see, 10 senators moved from the House to the Senate in 2023. 
So that's also uh, worth noting. On the other end of the spectrum, one House representative has been an elected official since 1987, and two senators have been in office since 1985. So it'll give you a long, oh, and that's, that's a long time. <laughs> it's almost 40 years. Over 6,700 bills were introduced in the 2023 legislative session, which averages out to about 33 bills per legislator. When the legislator was last controlled by one party, which was back in 2013, there were 3,200 bills. So just 3,200 bills the last time they could kind of roll through, and this year it doubled that, it was 6,700. So um, big difference. Uh, the House and Senate passed and sent 75 bills to the governor, and during the regular session in 2013, there were 144 bills sent to Governor Dayton. So when there was 3,200 bills in the last time, no, so just look at that difference, 144 went to Dayton's desk, this year 75 bills went to Governor Waltz's desk. In 2023, Governor Waltz vetoed only one bill, which was his first ever veto. Now there's a small audience here. Can anybody tell me what he vetoed? Do you remember? The Uber and the Uber and Lyft. Yeah. Very good. The Uber and Lyft bill. So, um, and that member made the news for a week about how Uber and Lyft were going to pull out of the state of Minnesota if that bill and legislature passed. And the governor stepped in and said, "Time out." While he said quite publicly he agreed with the premise of the bill, he still was going to veto it. Uh, I think because he didn't want to see those services leave the state. So, uh, winners and losers, and I'm going to. I'm going to, uh, Addy, who you're going to learn, uh, works for Taft, and they have a session wrap-up they put together, I think just about every year, as I've read it multiple times. Uh, so they did a, sesh, uh, a session wrap-up, and according to Taft, the winners this year, construction workers, taxpayers, and pot lovers. I think that was their exact word, pot lovers. I like that. <laughs> uh, losers, odds makers, online shoppers. What do you think the last one might be? Small business. Businesses. Thank you. And that's almost, an, and every single recap I looked at, I looked at about at 15 different versions of recaps. And from both sides of the political spectrum, those recaps are written. Every one of them said business was a loser. So that's pretty uniform. And that's probably why this room's a little bit, blood pressure's a little high, and why we kind of wanted to give that recap. So uh, with that, well, let me get to my right set of notes here. We're going to move into our bios. I'm going to first introduce. Uh, John Perlich. John is to our left. Probably can figure that out. But John currently serves as Senior Director of Public Affairs at the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce, advocating for member businesses and organizations. John brings a wealth of private, public, and nonprofit sector experience, including stints at Steve Rummer Hope Network, Ainsley Shea Communications, and various capacities within the Wisconsin GOP, the Wisconsin State Senate, and the Committee to Re-elect a Republican Senate. John has a, a Bachelor's of Arts in History and Political Science. In his spare time, you can find uh, JP extolling the virtues of his adoptive city, which is St. Paul, and the home state, Wisconsin. On the Board of Domestic Policy Caucus, enjoying the great outdoors during pheasant season and reading multiple books. And uh, in parentheses, nonfiction, of course, is what John noted there. John and his wife reside in the Highwood Hills area of St. Paul. So that's JP, one of our two, uh, Addie, right next to JP. Addie, uh, Addie Miller, JD, is the Director of Public Affairs at Taft Advisors and represents clients in a range of policy matters before the state legislative, municipalities, and executive agencies. The majority of her present work is in commerce, education, and health and human services. Prior to joining Taft Advisor, Addie served as Committee Administrator for the Minnesota House Commerce Committee with Chair Zach Stevenson, where her bipartisan work helped, bipartisan work helped create solutions to improve the lives of Minnesotans across the state in areas of consumer protection, insurance, banking, and health care. Prior to work in the Commerce Committee, Addie served as a committee administrator for the House Environmental Policy Committee and House Higher Education Committee. Addie grew up in a farm, on, a, on a farm in rural Carver County, near where she lives today with her two dogs, Chibs and Smooch, mm -hmm. love those names, <laughs> and spends her spare time taking and teaching yoga and showing Saddlebred and Morgan horses. So. Uh, that's our panel today. Uh, what we decided to do, because obviously there, you heard about how much legislation did come through. We decided that for this audience we needed to pick the top four or five business topics to talk about. There was a lot of other legislation I know people were passionate about, but remember in this case we're here to talk about business and its impact. So what we're going to do is first let uh, both of them just kind of give their state of their union address, essentially talk about what's near and dear to them, what their vision and view of this last year was, 
and then we're going to move on to those five topics. But we're going to start in reverse order from the bios. So, Addie, the floor is yours. Sounds good. Ooh, hearing my voice over microphone for the first time <laughs> in a while. Well, thanks for being here, you guys, and thanks for inviting uh, JP and I to be here. Um, I am a contract lobbyist, so I represent uh, many different clients in many different areas at the legislature. So, um, a couple things I wanted to highlight. This year, you heard there was a ton of new members. Um, there was also an entire class of legislators and staff who had never been in person before. They'd only done remote work over COVID. So there were some growing pains um, with new staff and new members being in person and figuring out the process and how it worked. Um, there was <clears throat> an added dynamic of the new minority leaders in the House and the Senate and a new majority leader in the Senate learning how to work with the Speaker of the House and the Governor's administration, again, for the first time all together. Um, the speed of session was unprecedented. So I've only been lobbying for two years. I work with uh, folks who have been lobbying for much longer than that, and even they said it was just a crazy uh, breakneck speed of session. So um, kind of a lot of uh, you don't know what it's happening until it happens. Um, lots of uh, quick, quick decisions were made, too. Um, the DFL arrived at the Capitol with a really voter-driven agenda, so it was kind of hard um, on some occasions for some non-populist issues to kind of get traction or bubble to the surface. So um, those of us with kind of smaller projects at the legislature are hoping for a, a more powerful uh, year next year for some of the smaller issues. Um, you saw a lot of those like sexy issues passing, right? Cannabis, pay family medical leave, we'll talk about those two today universal school lunches and the PFAS ban and um, not a lot of the smaller um, projects. So we also saw, you guys heard there was that one seat majority in the Senate. We saw more than one occasion of the Senator threatening uh, to, to tank a bill over some other issue. Um, more than one example of that. So I would expect to see that again next year. Um, in the midst of all of this, right, all of the, the infighting and, and things like that, we did see some really good shining examples of bipartisan agreement or compromise. There was a nursing home funding that came in kind of last minute um, to save a lot of these nursing homes that were going under. Um, there was a great bonding bill that passed this year. Tons of projects in there, and I would expect to see another one this year. Um, and the Social Security tax cut was something that kind of came up at the end of the, the session. So lots of happenings right up until that very end last couple weeks and then there was a lot of compromise um, to kind of get things finished at the end. So if I had to bet um, on the preview for next year, what might come up, sports betting did not pass this year. I would imagine that that comes up again this year. Um, the Uber Lyft bill that was vetoed, I'm sure we're going to see a part two of that. Um, some of you guys might have heard of the Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act. Um, there was a, a little not little, there was a big issue with Mayo, the nurses, the administration kind of all trying to work together to come to a compromise at the end. Um, I imagine we see a part two for that bill again. Um, the ERA, I imagine, will come up again. It's a policy year this upcoming year, so they'll be focused more on uh, non-fiscal items, non-financial items, so the ERA would be a big one of those. And then another, another opportunity for an additional bonding bill and a tax bill. That would be my bet. Thank you, Addie. JP, the floor is yours. I hate hearing my voice amplified. <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, thank you all for being here, Mark. Thanks for the invite. It's nice to see some familiar faces. So my takeaway from the 2023 legislative session, uh, I've been kind of referring to it by the working title of Trifecta of Taxes and Trepidation. Uh, you know, Addie has touched on the trifecta of DFL control. Uh, taxes, we'll, we'll get into uh, here in a little bit. And, and trepidation, right, especially for the business community in the midst of the, the tax bill, in the midst of inflation, possible recession, um, you know, access to capital, just kind of the overall cost of doing business is going up, has gone up, and businesses are, are weary about how these policy decisions are going to impact them. So uh, it was at times a little scary and, and a little uh, easy to get down about what was happening. But you know, elections elections matter, right? And so 
there was a, a DFL trifecta. Uh, we had mentioned the frenetic pace, right? It was, it was like Han Solo going into uh, hyperspeed on the Millennium Falcon, it felt like <laughs> at times. Uh, Eddie had talked about bipartisanship, and while there was some bipartisanship, I, I would say it was very limited, um, especially when we saw the DFL accepting GOP amendments in committee and then stripping those out in conference committee. Yes, there were a couple of big ones, uh, the bonding bill, etc. but in reality it was a very limited bipartisanship and not much voice for the business community. Uh, I'll talk more about it, but in the paid family leave de medical leave debates, it was almost like they they don't need, they didn't want to listen to the business owners, to the business community, to the employers about how these policies will actually impact small business. Um, and just to kind of set the stage, right, we started this budget cycle with an $18 billion surplus, right? That's a, that's a big number. Um, and there was talks of $1,000 rebates, full full repeal of social security taxes. Um, what did we end up with, right? Limited, limited rebate of you know, 260 bucks per person if you make under $75,000. Uh, 10 billion in new taxes, which is a 38% 30, increase over current state spending. Um, really growing government uh, through some of these programs. And I really like the fact that Mark mentioned, you know, 6,700 bills. That is an ungodly amount of legislation. I'm glad I don't work for the state revisor's office because that is a lot of drafting. Um, and I, I, would, I think I would be remiss if I didn't say that the taxpayer, the argument can be made that the taxpayer was a loser in this budget cycle. Right? Be it an employee, an employer, a retiree, <coughs> You know, there was there were some tax implications that are not good for all all Minnesota residents. Um, and kind of the one thing is we, we mentioned the the narrow majorities, right? The DFL leadership was really able to keep some of their more vulnerable members on side on on a myriad of issues. Um, you know, social security tax deductions. Uh, guns, gun reform, right? With a one vote majority, it's important to be able to keep your caucus together because as was mentioned, one vote can tank a bill and we didn't, didn't see that. So, you know, taxes, trifecta, and trepidation. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thanks, both of you. That was a, a it's interesting because you try to find, you know, and we all met a week ago and trying to find, okay, try to keep this neutral because the goal is to inform not to not to slam any one of our personal opinions down but to try to inform and that's that's really hard uh, just because you know we all come with the personal bias and trying to find negative for your behavior might not be it's always always a challenge so uh real quick just want to let you know there's there's a few things on the table number one there's a blue uh not enough necessarily for everybody there's a lot of print but there's a blue thing put together by the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and that's just voting records. Uh, so of most of the things we're talking about today, the only thing that really isn't in there is Canvas, uh, but it'll give you how everybody voted uh, on that stuff. This is also available, if you just Google the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, this exact piece is available. Uh, the other one, it's, uh, and I, I, I believe so much in this, is that there's a way for everybody in every industry to get involved. And so I've got my contact information on the table, I welcome any personal conversations from anybody saying, how do I get involved? And I will find a way, uh, whether no matter where, what industry you're in, I, I can have people that can find opportunities for you to get engaged and involved. And as these both said, elections have consequences, so how do you get involved to help uh, shape what the next election cycle looks like and policies look like? So uh, that's my contact information for that purpose. Or might be more important to some than topic one we're not trying to make that but the one that has the most conversation where we're going to start and how we're going to do this is they're each going to take turns on 
one of the topics, and we picked them ahead of time. Uh, but the other panelists are going to be able to chime in. And we're also, we, we don't have to wait till the end to take questions. If you have a comment or a question, but again, remember, they're not the ones who wrote the legislation nor passed it. Uh, but if there's any questions, specifics, or impact stuff that, that any one of us, and I can chime in as well, um, have. So we're going to start with what was uh, House File 2. Last year, we talked a lot about this at the Oakdale Chamber Board and at the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act. So with that, uh, uh, JP is going to introduce that topic, talk a little bit about what that bill was, and he has a chance to chime in, and then we're going to certainly, as we go, open the floor to questions, comments, thoughts, and uh, away we go. So JP. Thank you, Mark. Uh, in full disclosure, I am not a lawyer or an actuarial, so uh, don't take this all with a grain of salt. Um, paid Family Medical Leave, House File 2, uh, it comes into effect on January 1, 2026. And what the state did was, uh, the legislature did, was created a new state-run, state-administered uh, paid family and medical leave program for all employees. Uh, this will provide up to 12 weeks of paid leave uh, for serious health conditions or pregnancy, and 12 weeks of paid leave for parental leave, safety leave, caregiving leave, uh, deployment if you're in the military. And, and so that equals out to, I, I believe it's about 480 hours over a 12 month period for each and every employee. Um, that tax on with other benefits that employees have access to, uh, PTO, comp time, vacation, et cetera. And the, the program will be run, it'll be funded uh, based off a tax, uh, a tax on the employer of 0.7% per year. Uh, that tax can be split 50-50 between employer and employee. And it's kind of like the unemployment insurance trust fund program. Um, and like I said, they, there was, this was one of those issues where the legislator, legislators didn't seem to want to hear from the business community. Uh, there was, you know, we testified on the bill, we wrote letters on the bill, and asked for an actuarial study, right? What is this actually going to cost? Um, you know, how is this going to remain solvent? Does the state just keep raising that? 0.7% tax rate every time the, the fund falters, like we saw with the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund uh, two years ago. So, you know, 400 new employees, a, a specific mandate, right? It's not a, a spectrum of you can offer this to this if you want to opt out. It is, if you own a business, you're either in this program or you set up your own program that gives the exact same benefits. There is no, it's, it's, a, it's a one size fits all approach that probably doesn't work for each and every business in our state. Um, and you know, it's, I guess I struggle with the, the staffing, right? Say you have an employee that has to take paid family medical leave but you need to bring someone in to train that person, to get that person up to speed, to just say in the next four weeks, okay, now I gotta let you go because this other person is coming back. I think this is one of those where you saw the DFL trifecta kind of put their heads down and, and ram it through without a lot of debate and a lot of discourse on the practicalities of, of this policy. How does it affect our insurance agents, our retail operations, our, our, our general employer community? Um, and again, that leads to the trepidation part of taxes, trifecta, and trepidation. So that's kind of my two cents on it. Oh, and it's estimated to cost about $1.5 billion a year. So uh, there's that too. <clears throat> I don't have two. Nick, do you want to ask a question first? Just, just point of clarification. Yeah. When you said legislators, uh, Republicans were listening, but the Democrats did not. That's the point of clarification because we, a number of us did get contact, and they were very receptive to that. So, <coughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah, the, the debates on this were plentiful. I will not say they were productive. Um, it was, it, again, one of those voter-driven issues. The DFL felt very strongly that their voter base wanted to see this pass and um, had been working on this for multiple years. So it was kind of one of those, now the log jam is gone and we can get stuff through. So, um, yeah, but I would agree with that. There was a lot of kind of one-sided debate. Yeah. Okay, just a little bit of follow-up question to Nate there. <coughs> They're not listening to us. So now that it's passed and it's behind, any hindsight, hindsight 2020 advice or something that we could have done differently to get more voice or get them to hear on the opposing side? Just, just to repeat that for the camera, the, the viewing audience, the question was, is there anything we could have done or should we have done 2020-wise better to get a change in the result? Would, would any more engagement on behalf of the business community, anything that we could have done in the room? I'm paraphrasing your question. Perfect. Do you want to say that one first? Go ahead. Okay. So <clears throat> I would say to not get discouraged. I would say to not get discouraged in your engagement. Doing everything you possibly can to continue to get engaged, whether it's through the chamber, or whether it's through an advocacy group on an issue that you care about, whether it's just donating to candidates that you really think are going to do a good job. Elections have consequences. Getting involved matters, even though this year it wasn't as impactful as some of us would have liked it to see. So unfortunately, I don't have a good, uh, you know, this is the silver bullet for you, um, but just don't get discouraged. Keep continuing to make your voices heard. There's just simply not enough noise um, at the legislature on certain issues. So just keep, keep at it. And the question was in hindsight. So, uh, you know, just to be clear, I don't have any connections to any of the caucuses or political parties or electioneering. Um, but you know, in hindsight, vote and run better candidates on the GOP side, you know, run on a message that resonates with voters. And, you know, I think we saw that out here in kind of the East Metro running some very fringe candidates who lost races in these very important uh, majority making districts. You know, you flip one or two seats in the Senate and a couple of seats in the House, and it's a different ball game. Um, and now is when the work starts, right? Now is this is in the pipeline. It is coming in 2026. Now you need to start start taking the steps and thinking about how am I going to implement this? It creates more red tape for me as a business owner. It creates more work for me on the back end to administer this program you know, on, on a business by business level. So really putting that work in now to, to be ready for it and then continue to vote and talk to your legislators and advocate for changes. I, I'd be up for some changes to the program, but we'll see what happens. Real quick and just to add, you know, I, as I prepared for today and as I've been updating the board for months, I've been talking to clients. I'm a business banker by trade and we're blessed with a board with several of us that do nothing but connect with businesses. And I, I, I actually had them all written down, connected with 19 of them since this thing started. Uh, and 100% of those 19 said they are likely, now they use the word likely, they're likely to reduce their benefits to their employees because they got to pay for this somehow. Uh, and the 0.7 taxes, while it's great they can split it 50-50, they're not going to be competitive in the workforce if they do. So there's some things that are, I think those type of stories are going to start to resonate. And especially, like I said, two Senate seats shift, the trifecta is gone. House seats shift, and so, you know, and I would say this if it was the other way around. I'm, I'm a big fan of having checks and balances in government. So if it was all three R's, I'd probably say, probably not good either. You probably want to have uh, the other. So, what are my one question to, to end this issue? We're going to, obviously, we got four more to go over, and so it's kind of quick fire. Uh, and you see, with 4,700 bills, it'd be really hard. What would be, you think, your prospect of changes to this? I mean, is how likely is amendments and changes to this to be, or is, you know, some people said, boy, once this is in, this is gonna be really hard to pull back the banana peel. What's what's the thoughts there? No, either one in, or both. Right now, change is gonna be hard. Um, you know, 2024, the House is up for election. 2026, the Senate is up for election and the governor. So, I mean, it's, it will be here through 2026, um, but it's now time to start thinking about those elections and those outcomes and engaging with your current elected officials to, to share your 
own experience, right? Put a name to the story. Put a face to the story. Hey, I'm Mark Cove. I have this business. This is how paid family medical leave is impacting me, impacting my employees, impacting what I can offer the community. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a few years off and change is hard with government programs. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you can always amend a bill later, um, but with the excitement around this one, uh, with the, the majority caucuses, I don't see that happening too soon. Right, one question before I move on, Russ. No, I, have a, I don't have a question, but I got a little story about St. Paul. Okay, uh, yeah, if we, could, we just have another report. So, if you can keep it quick, let's go. Yeah. I'm in the back there, so it came in late. Yeah, All right. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Yeah. So, I've owned a business downtown for 40 years, a small publishing firm. I've seen a lot of trend and change in the St. Paul area, and uh, St. Paul has never been business friendly and uh, levying taxes on businesses and uh, property owners. I'm talking about bit buildings and properties and that type of thing. And over a period of about 10 years, there's businesses, big businesses, started leaving St. Paul, Burlington Northern, Amoy Derrick, and many more. And um, by two th uh, 1991, um, over 10,000 jobs had left the downtown because they couldn't get anything accomplished. Uh, the World Trade Center was not built by big businesses, but uh, Latimer used um, labor money to do it. It was a complete failure. And, uh, and so I know the importance of having businesses involved in things, you know, and kind of spearheading things and helping them to meet, because if you raise the price to businesses, they gotta raise the prices to the consumer. And what does that do? It shoots prices up. And everyone that causes inflation. So you can either be on the supply side of economics or on the demand side of economics. Supply side says you put a lot of supply and a lot of volume into the economy and it drives prices down. Demand side says you limit supply and the demand for that increases oversupply and prices go up. So you have a two-party system here you see and you can figure that out for yourself. The important thing is to be um, very business friendly and help the big businesses out so they can help others out. Um, I was with um, Amos Martin, uh, president of the St. Paul Chamber. We were walking down the Skyway at one time in the late 80s or early, uh, early 90s, too long ago. But this is a story to remember, okay? He said to me, uh, what happened to West Publishing? He said he was in a meeting, the president of the chamber, the president of the chamber in St. Paul is big. And um, him, the chairman of West Publishing, and Jim, La and Jim Scheibel, then the mayor. West Publishing needed more parking. So they asked the mayor for more parking, and he turned him down. Turned him down flat. The next morning, as Mr. Smart told me, the chairman of the board for West Publishing went out to Egan. And now it's the last you saw West Publishing downtown St. Paul. They took 5,500 employees out of downtown St. Paul, dried it up, and downtown St. Paul became a hole. You know, it's just a terrible thing that happened. But the importance of being business friendly is very, very important. And if you neglect and ignore that, the whole state's going to come like that too. Because this is starting at a state level. That's all I got to say. Thanks, Thanks Russ. All right, next topic, a good conversation. This one obviously was a big one. Uh, number two is going to be Andy Miller talking about uh, uh, HF19, House File 19, which is earned, safe, and sick time. Yes, yeah, so different than paid family medical leave. It took me a minute to figure that out at the beginning of this year. Uh, so this one is effective uh, January 1st of this upcoming January 2024. Um, all employers with one or more employees, that includes part-time, it includes temp workers, um, now have to offer 48 hours of paid time each year for uh, physical or mental illness, health care and treatment, uh, care of a sick family member, care of a family member due to school or work closure, or due to domestic abuse or sexual assault. There's a lot more um, kind of parameters around those relationships and what um, the leave can be used for. I won't go into that here. 
Um, employees earn one hour for every 30 hours worked, up to 48 hours per year. Uh, they can't use it unless they've worked in Minnesota for at least 80 hours. Not necessarily the same job, but just in the state. Um, unused sick time must be allowed to carry over to the next year, up to 80 hours, or paid out at the year's end. There is an exception if an employer already provides um, 80 hours of paid leave at the beginning of the year, either through PTO or sick leave. Um, the accrual and carryover and payout requirements don't then apply. Um, employers are not required to pay out the accrued sick and safe time on termination, just at your end. Uh, and there are additional record keeping requirements to provide employees with earning statements each pay period and there are notice requirements for the employees if the leave, if the need for the leave is, um, is foreseen. Uh, there is a prohibition against retaliation against employees for taking the time off um, and there's no requirement for that employee to find coverage. That's the quick and dirty, any questions on that one? What was the bill? HF 19. Earn sick and safe time. Okay. So that one is just, you know, keep this flowing and JP, I'll let you chime in. It's obviously kind of a somewhat related to that first one, but as you can see, drastically different. It's, it's benefits that add on top of that other stack. So again, more issues for employers of how to, how to fund it. That one's not a taxpayer. I mean, it's not something that necessarily has a, has a tax associated to it, but it's still certainly a burden on the employer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you kind of covered it, Mark. I, this is, again, I get back to trepidation. It, it's, it's government adding numerous layers of record keeping, red tape, taxation onto the backs of business and employers. You know, I, in my wayward youth, I had a defense lawyer who used to like to talk about the totality of circumstances. And this is kind of starting to see the totality of circumstances uh, piling up onto business and what that impact is going to be to our, our small businesses, our, our job creators, our, our kind of the lifeblood of our community. So uh, I, I just, trepidation. <laughs> and I think Addie mentioned this, but this one, this one takes effect in five months. This one's January 1st, 2024. The other one, HF2, the big one was two more years. So that's 26, January 1 to 26. So, Mr. Morley, do you have a question? So most of us are kind of busy and we've got this thing that we have to implement in the next four or five months. Is there a, is there a implementation for dummies somewhere that I can get my hands on? <laughs> that, that, so uh, the question for the audience is, there, a, is there an implementation guide? Is the state putting out any kind of materials that's going to help employers that are, are like those in this room, maybe five, six employees? Uh, to help them navigate these waters? The answer to me is, I think so, I haven't seen it yet. So I, will, I would love to see, uh, I mean, I heard they were drafting one, I heard they were supposed to have a guide, but uh, Mr. Morley, I have not seen that yet. So my guess is that I'm gonna hope that by fall, there's gonna be something that comes out from the Minnesota Department of Labor that's gonna hopefully guide, here's the steps you need to do to comply with the law. Uh, I don't know if it's a poster in your break room, but I believe, but I have not, seen, I don't know if either of you two have seen it, I haven't seen it. Yeah. I also heard, sorry, also heard they were drafting something, also have not seen it, yeah. so, did I? So, Bill yeah. Burns. Yeah, Rachel, Our Rachel. Like a community throughout a nonprofit with um, less than 12 employees. You had mentioned that there was no exemption on the HF-19, and if you're beyond the solo employee, was there <coughs> anything with the, the first one that they, um, from the family? I think there is a for smaller agencies, there's no exemption. It's one employer greater. It was yeah. also no small business. Yeah. Right. right. So apologize for that answer. I have Bill Burns next. So what you're saying, so as a small business, you have three employees. So if one of them gets a cold and they have a stuffed up head and they say, oh, it's, I can't commit to that. You really can't do anything about it. I mean, just stay home and then stay home another day stay home another day. It, you're just, your hands are tied via the state, correct? Five times. Yeah, I would say just yes. Yeah. yeah. The answer of his business is, are their hands tied if, if things get sick? I would say, if, if without amendment or clarification of these rules, the answer is yes. Sorry to give you that answer. Is there any other quick question? We've got about one minute before we want to get on the next couple of topics. 
Go ahead. Hi, Ben Millard, Dr. Fish, Bolivia, Minnesota Leadership Center. Um, how does this play when you've got one, two, or a small pool of part-time employees that are very flex time? You know, I'm talking two to five hours that come in to check and sort the mail and that sort of thing. Maybe they don't accrue 48 hours for the year on their working time. Like, how, and then when they do get sick, maybe they only work Tuesday and Wednesday, so they just make it up Thursday and Friday. I mean, that's how I think a lot of us are used to doing it now, taking time off and come back and work later. What, what's the consideration there? Okay, so this for the camera, so they're really paraphrasing just what's the impact on part-time or, or contractual labor, things that are smaller. Um, yeah. There's unfortunately no exemptions for part-time, regardless of how their schedule is set up. So as long as they're <clears throat> earning um, one hour for every 30 hours worked, maybe they don't work 30 hours. Um, but unfortunately, there's no exemptions for part-time employees. The only thing I'd add to that one is if they're not scheduled on Tuesday, Wednesday, and that's the days they're sick, I wouldn't think they'd necessarily that's be true. able to use those for sick time. That's true. So. Really quick one. Did I hear you say that if we offer like a PTO, like two weeks of PTO, that circumvents this program and you don't have to offer it? Yeah, you can always offer more. Um, anything that exceeds what's in this bill, um, that's that kind of supersedes whatever the bill is requiring then. Yeah. Thank you. All right, on to the next one. Uh, JP, John's going to cover this one. And this is the 2023 tax bill, which would be House File 1938, for those that are tracking at home. So. Buckle up. <laughs> that's me, that's me. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, buckle up is right. Um, so, we started off with 17.5 to $18 billion surplus. Then uh, the tax committee met <laughs> and did some things, uh, which all told equals out to about a $10 billion tax increase. Uh, in total, 1.2 billion tax increase uh, for the next four years. Um, again, this is where we didn't see a lot of bipartisanship because they didn't need to be bipartisan. Um, were there some good things in the tax bill? Yes, right, the tax deductible portion of Social Security. Um, but there were some really bad things combined mandatory worldwide reporting. Um, if your municipality asked for a local sales tax increase to put to the voters, I mean, you got it. Um, and you know, it just, in, in, because we are running short on time as we get into these other things, I mean, they added a 0.25% housing sales tax in the metro, a 0.75% Sales, metro sales tax to go to transportation. Uh, they included a 50 cent delivery fee for orders of $100 or more. It's gas tax indexing, registration tax increases. This is all in the transportation bill for the most part, but it had to go through the tax committee. Motor vehicle sales tax increases, auto parts sales tax. Um, you know, the, the rebates went from $1,000 a person to $260 a person uh, if you make less than 75 grand a year. So I, the tax bill was, I don't want to say bad, but the tax bill will fund some infrastructure, will fund some housing, will provide some money back into communities, uh, but there is also going to be a financial repercussion to the consumers of these products, especially in the seven county metro. Um, you know, and for me as a St. Paul resident, uh, one of the highest sales taxes in the state, my property taxes just went up 15%. Now the state raises my sales tax 1% and now the mayor is asking for another 1%. Again, you can see these kind of layers of taxation um, all while we're still in pretty high inflation. So I, I wish I had something good to say about the tax bill. Oh, I do have something good to say about the tax bill. Uh, Oakdale is gonna hopefully get some money for a public works and a new police facility. So there, there's that. Is the chief still here? <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said, it was, uh, 
it was a little depressing. Real quick before we get to add in to another minute before we get to question, it is, it is basically 1259, so it's the normal stop. We'll keep going for five or 10 minutes if you can stay great, but no, you can just get up and leave if you have to get out. Uh, and what I thought we'd do before we get to questions, let's get to number four because of the, the symbiotic relationship. Uh, and that would be, so Andy, I'll sort of let you comment on what JP said, but uh, we can talk about uh, 2887, HF 2887, it's a transportation omnibus bill. So there's a good chunk of that that has to do with taxation. So let's talk about both those together. Unfortunately, we're probably going to skip cannabis. We just don't have time today. But uh, these are the these are the number four topics. And, uh, She's like, I'll talk to you guys about that later. All right. <laughs> so the transportation omnibus bill, um, we saw a lot of omnibus bills, giant omnibus bills this year. Transportation was definitely one of them. A um, couple things that JP already mentioned, indexing the um, motor fuel tax to inflation. Uh, there was a 75% increase in the sales tax in the seven county metro area, again, just to fund public transit and county roads. Uh, there's a 50 cent delivery fee on deliveries costing over $100. Food is exempt, there's a couple other exemptions, I think medicine. Um, in that omnibus bill, the transportation one, uh, $8.8 .8 billion was authorized to uh, DOT and DPS. Um, for things like building the Northern Lights Express passenger rail between Twi Twin Cities and Duluth, extension of the Blue Line, and tons of overdue road projects, one in my district, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, local bridges and safe routes to school programs. Um, they did increase the motor vehicle sales tax from 0.375% to 0.685%. Increase the vehicle registration uh, tax to uh, from 1.54% to 1.58%. And then there was a bunch of policy items in there as well. Um, just to lift up a few, they are requiring new development of a remote application process for driver's license uh, applications, which is pretty cool. Uh, requiring consideration of greenhouse gas emissions in transportation planning, so city planners will need to focus on that. Um, and establishing a clean transportation fuel standard working group and a transit rider safety working group. Lots of stuff. So we'll, we'll have, but here's what I'm going to do too. I'm going to, I just want to show of hands real quick. If our board decided to have one meeting guest speaker to be just on cannabis, would you be interested in that? Like we're going to do that in public. I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah. But I think it would be a fascinating <laughs> meeting to talk about just the process and the, the implications. We can bring that topic back. I mean, Bill Burns is an expert because of his use. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so is there any, I mean, you heard some of this, I mean, some of this that I think is amazing is that, you know, the, the motor vehicle sales tax increase almost doubled. Think about that for a second. In a, in a time we had an $18 billion surplus, you know, I mean, and, uh, and, and one thing that wasn't talked about is the, uh, right now there's a 1.21 statewide increase on a shift of property taxes from residents to businesses. So it's going to, it's going to take 1.2. 1% of the tax burden from people and increase that onto businesses. And in the metro area, and in most, in a lot of others, 2.23% shift. That's pretty big. So there's room for improvement. Any other questions on these two bills since we kind of put it together? Is so there any information on how they calculate greenhouse gases during these projects? I don't mean this to sound snarky, but when I look at, okay, maybe I do. Sure you do. <laughs> When I look at the number of steam shovels and road graders and things that are building the gold line, like the greenhouse gas emissions are off the hook. So how does this all get calculated? So the question was on greenhouse gas calculations. How does that get calculated? Well, I was not the uh, House Committee Administrator for the Environment <laughs> Committee, so I might turn this one over to my colleague. And if I was still there, I would say call MPCA for that information. I'm not, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, MPCA does have some uh, internal processes already. Um, I'm sure they're going to have to expand onto that. Um, and I believe they did get some funding for additional employees for that as well to help with regulations. And just to be clear, I heard someone over here clap for online driver's licenses. Let's not forget that uh, this is the agency that brought you Minlars, so you might want to hold that uh, applause for a while. Uh, one other thing, I know, I know JP talked about this. My mic, did I turn it off? Sorry. Turn my mic off. Uh, he talked about this, the, uh, the combined mandatory worldwide reporting. I still don't necessarily know what that is, but I do know the adjectives or the descriptions that went around it, which is 
No other state or country in the world imposes such a thing. Oh, so just as an FYI, Minnesota's the trailblazer on whatever <laughs> combined <laughs> mandatory worldwide reporting is. So uh, is there a uh, question? Yeah. Well, um Is that another one that goes in 2026? I want it. I want it. I believe it's this year. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's either that or it's June of next year. I, I was one of the two. It's it's within the next year and a half, I would say, at least. And they're extending the amount of time, you know, so they're, they're changing the year totals on the cars, too. It's you know, So, you know, right now, if you have a nine-year-old car, you know how your tabs go way down? Now that chart is going to be expanded, so a nine-year-old car might act like a today's six-year-old car. Good. Just for the record. So there's, there's a one-page PDF of the timeline of all these on the Minnesota Chamber oh, website. Yeah, you go to it, it has this all. Yep. And I, that is the best lead-in ever because the, the last thing I wanted to talk about today was next steps. Yeah, that's why my card's there. I'm, I'm willing to, I know enough people and between JP and Addy and all of our friends, we will find a way to get you connected if you want to get involved in your industry association. Again, the St. Paul Chamber PAC board, which we've had Mr. Schwartz, who actually has hand up as part of that. So, but Tony, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, I'm licensed realtor in the state of Florida. <laughs> and uh, I help a lot of people buy homes in Florida, so look me up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, T. Schwartz, uh, uh, EXP Real Estate, <laughs> Florida. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I actually had a question about the chamber. I feel like you got flat footed on this session, um, and you say get more involved. It doesn't matter. The DFL has all the money. Obviously, the Republicans have no money. So, we try to participate through our chambers because we all have businesses to run. I don't feel the chambers really represented our interests. Do you have any plans or thoughts on the inefficiency of the chamber to address any of these business processes? Yeah, let me start, and I'll certainly let our president up to speak. Uh, on behalf of the Oak Hill Area Chamber, we try to stay somewhat neutral to that. We have we have a political action committee whose job is not, we have a monitor, I mean, we don't have a PAC, but we have something to try to stay tuned to it. We did get members to try to write letters. Uh, but then there's the, the bigger chambers, like the Minnesota Chamber, the St. Paul Area Chamber, the Minneapolis Chamber, and, and I wrote I wrote personally probably 25 letters. It it literally fell on deaf. I mean, you're right. There should be more. It's just nobody was in. I actually got told by a legislative official that the polling shows they don't need the support of business, so it's just not going to be listened to this year. That was actually straight out of a rep's mouth. So that kind of thing does happen. You're right. It needs to be better. It needs to be bigger, which is why we're doing this. Uh, even though we try to stay that neutral line, and this board's done a great job of that for years, but you know. I think we're past that point probably, which is why we're here. So here, uh, Nathan. In its weakest grassroots uh, formation right here, the Washington County Coalition, it's, it's, it's just loosely put together by all the chambers in, in our county, okay? President Lori Steiger from the Woodbury Chamber of Commerce had written a letter on our behalf from the Washington County Coalition that fell on deaf ears. So even in banded numbers, our, our chambers of commerce felt like our hands were tied in this last legislative session. So, so what are you going to do different, I guess, is my question. Because uh, obviously we as businesses try to stay neutral also, not be political. But I mean, is there like a legal fund or some kind of action to respond to some yeah. of these things going forward? I would say the best donate of, you know, right now through the organized PACs that have it. Again, the St. Paul Chamber has a PAC that can accept funds and they're using it to do nothing but to get candidates friendly to the mission of business or to, even if they're not friendly to the mission, but to at least respect and understand the position of the chambers. So that's number one. Number two, I'd say every industry association, if you are, if you own a, a cement shop and are not part of the, the industry association for cement shops, you need to be. Uh, to me, that's the biggest thing. That's, that was our next steps that we wanted to talk about here today. It's why my card's on the table. Everybody should get involved. It's, it's past the point we can say somebody else has got this. Because okay. somebody else doesn't have it anymore. So the answer to your question is, is all of us, and I use that even, I'll, I've been quite engaged for 20 some years, I didn't do enough. I felt, boy, if I would have only done these few extra things, we all have to try to get our voices heard, get engaged, so we don't have what Russ said up happened in St. Paul when you start having this exodus, because by then it's too late. Now it's going to take 25 years to come back. And there, you know, it's, it's, it's again, I use the same, and I said it earlier tonight, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
I'm not questioning the intentions. I'm not trying to even down the intentions of some of the people that were part of these bills. I just think the, the, the consequence of them wasn't thought through. So if it has a negative impact, if 19 out of 19 businesses are going to reduce their benefits to their employees, did you just make a, a, a legislative law that's better or did you make it worse? And so really is Uber get engaged and you know, and this chamber is certainly going to listen, you know, send, send, send messages to our board. If you have suggestions of how we can better engage, we will listen. I can tell you right now, we are hungry for ideas and for people to, to say, let's do this. Uh, but you know, right now it's just, you're right. It's, it's, it's got, it's got to step up and it's got to step up everywhere. Mark, being on the board of this chamber and I'm on the board of the St. Paul chamber, I got to tell you guys, it is really difficult for chambers to take two to go too far in any direction because the, the, the outlashing you get from the cities that you're in and you're working in and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's almost a no-win situation. You know, the St. Paul Chamber has done a great job with their pack and stuff and they still, it's almost like if, if they put their endorsement on a candidate, it, it can hurt that candidate because, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's a sad sign that's going on, but it's really hard for the chambers to be 100% on this side of, of something because the, the, there's a lot of uh, negative, negative things that happen. And that's a really good point. One thing I'll say out of the 19 businesses, some of those I talked about, talk, talk to half of them before the, bill, half the bills passed, and I couldn't get one of them to publicly go on record with their business name. Yep. And, and, that, and I'll be honest, I would struggle because it's like, I don't want to be listed as the one that quote hates people and don't want them to have family medical aid leave. That's not true about how I run my business or how most of you run your business, but you certainly don't want to be that poster child somebody puts up in the break room and says, this business you know, hates its employees. Because that's what that's the conclusion that's drawn when you fight these type of bills. So it's got to come through thoughtful dialogue and I think you heard both candidates or both candidates. <laughs> what you're running for. Both <laughs> panelists say it comes down to elections. And that's yeah. on both sides. You've got to get the right people because I don't care what, you know, no matter what party you identify with, if it's a weak candidate, I'm not supporting them. And I think most of the people in this room mm -hmm. act that way. So it's about quality people to represent us. That's going to that's gonna be maybe the biggest single thing we can do here is to find a way to get the best candidates and stop supporting people that don't support your ideals. Even if you think they're a nice guy or gal. That's why the voting record's on the table here. Uh, you can see how your legislative officials voted for some of this legislation. If you're passionate about it, you make sure you don't check that checkbox next time that, that election cycle comes. Mark. Yeah. Russ, uh, what's the position of the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce? Because that's huge. Yeah, you can act, they have a, in fact, if you read this, this voting record, it comes out. They were against, they were against most of this. Um, and again, if you go on their website, because again, you know, what I like about them is they put a lot of time and energy into these publications. The rest of us don't have that dollars. Uh, you can pull up their, their positions on all these bills right on the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce website. Did you notice in here too, if you read through this, that most of the bills that the Chamber supported did not pass? 100%. And they meant that. 100%. And, 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 and all that they, they were opposed to pass. It's, there was like, only one that they were aligned to. I just went through a count. It's, it's, it's right here. <laughs> and again, the Minnesota Chamber, again, it, it, a couple things passing. If you're not members of the St. Paul Area Chamber, I encourage you to use our partnership and join them. There's strength, strength in numbers there. They have a really good government affairs. Companies like TAF, that, that, that's their job is to help you know, make that presence known. That's what Annie does for a living, goes out and, and, and supports issues to make sure that, you know, that, that those voices get heard and then just getting involved and getting engaged. So I know we are now 10, 12 minutes over time. We could go on forever on this topic. Um, probably a business to try five, but we will talk as a board to see if we want to have a, a whole meeting at some point dedicated to what, what the, heck the impact of cannabis will be. So stay tuned for that. And first off, just want to thank JP and Annie. Uh, appreciate that. So Kim O'Brien has to somewhat sit next to him somewhere. So, <laughs> so buy me a drink. <laughs> it's all good fun. No, I guess it could go the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all. Thank you.